Te de koto te fano o Aotearoa Unitarians. Te de koto na manahiri, no mai, higher mai, ki tene hui topa a te atua, te de koto te de tato katoa. Yes, I can almost hear you. Suspended between all that was and all that might be, we struggle to find this very moment, to live this very moment. Let us sit together for a moment and savor this moment. Let us relish this between time where past meets future. Let us harbor a faith that reminds us that right now, right here, is enough. My opening words are entitled, Life is Always Unfinished Business, by Richard Gilbert. In the midst of the whirling day, in the hectic rush to be doing, in the frantic pace of life, pause here for a moment. Catch your breath, relax your body, loosen your grip on life. Consider that all our lives are always unfinished business. Imagine that the picture of our being is never complete. Allow your life to be a work in progress. Do not hurry to mold the masterpiece. Do not rush to finish the picture. Do not be impatient to complete the drawing. From beckoning birth to dawning death, we are in progress, process. And always there is more to be done. Do not let the incompleteness weigh on your spirit. Do not despair that imperfection marks your every day. Do not fear that we shall, we are still in the making. Let us instead be grateful that the world is still to be created. Let us give thanks that we can be more than we are. Let us celebrate the power of the incomplete. For life is always unfinished business. Our opening song requires quite an introduction. I decided we ought to celebrate the Queen's Jubilee. So I'm playing a portion of, well, the opening uh, sung by Andrea uh, Bocelli. Bocelli. Uh, he sings of, from an opera set in Peking, China. Caliph, an unknown prince, falls in love at first sight with the beautiful but haughty princess Turandot. According to royal edict, however, any suitor who wishes to marry her must correctly answer three riddles. Those who fail are killed. Despite protests from his father and servant, Caliph accepts the challenge and is determined to marry Turando, much to the delight of the prince's father, as well as the entire kingdom. Caliph answers all three riddles correctly, but Turando refuses to marry this stranger. She doesn't even know his name. The prince then makes a deal with her. If she can figure out his name before dawn, he will gladly die. If she cannot, they will marry. Turando agrees, and the countdown begins. Late that night, the princess declares that no one shall sleep until she learns the name of her suitor. In fact, she carries, cries out that everyone in the kingdom will be killed if no one steps forward to reveal Caliph's identity. Meanwhile, Caliph confidently sings, Nessun Dorma. Nobody shall sleep. Now, the backstory to this is that 
1990 in Italy to open up the FIFA World Cup, Luciano Pavarotti sang this and it was played over the BBC in England. And England fell in love with opera. So it was appropriate in the kickoff of the Queen's Jubilee that Andrea Luciano died, I think in 1907, uh, that Andrea Bocelli sing it. If you're not familiar with him, he's blind. He lives in darkness, but sings the light. And for those who, of you whose Italian is a little rusty, the words of the song are, nobody shall sleep, nobody shall sleep. Even you, O Princess, in your cold room, watch the stars that tremble with love and with hope. But my secret is hidden within me. My name no one shall know. No. On your mouth, I will tell it when the light shines. And my kiss will dissolve the silence that makes you mine. No one will know his name, and we must at last die. Vanish, O night, set stars, set stars. At dawn, I will win, I will win, I will win. Enjoy it. If you have a chalice or a candle, it's time to light it. And my words are by a Muslim UU minister, Summer Al-Bayati. In betwixt and in between, we move in the liminal spaces that show shades of what can be, what can be. We light this chal we light this chalice as a symbol of courage to move into that time of this and that and not this and not that with patience and faith and love and hope that this time will pass like the sun that moves in between rising and setting reminding us that beauty resounds in betwixt and in between. I decided that uh, from our hymnal, the song, Let It Be a Dance, captured much of what I wanted to talk about today. So, you know, if you get the song, you don't have to listen to the music later, okay? So, could we play the song? I have two readings for us this morning. The first is entitled Solstice by Gary Kowalski. Night has its own kind of beauty different than the beauty of day. Night is a time of sleep and dreams and inward visions, a time of pause within activity. Darkness is an invitation to imagining and storytelling and to use ears instead of eyes to listen to the world in its stillness. Darkness is the den of life in germination, and darkness is the portal of death that opens to eternity. At the center of our being, there is light and there is darkness, the known and the unknown, the named and the nameless, the finite and the infinite. 
light and dark are different, but not opposed to each other. Like a mother and father, they are friends with one another and with us. My second reading is called Startled into Noticing. And it's by a UU minister who lives in Groton, Massachusetts. In fact, has been their minister for over 20 years. If I'd taken a job at, in Groton once, offered, I might have known her. So I was drawn to it. Her name was Alea Kimler is Leia Kimler. She starts her meditation with a quote from Pablo Neruda entitled A Calars, which is keeping quiet. If we could perhaps do nothing for once, perhaps a great silence would interrupt the sadness, this never understanding ourselves and threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth is teaching us. Her meditation goes on. One of the regular columns at our small town weekly newspaper is the animal activity blotter from the animal control officer. It's my favorite thing in the paper. Here's a recent entry. March saw a relatively small number of animal control calls as follows. Loose dogs, five. Squirrel and house, one. Skunk and trap, one. Able to talk to trapper through an uneventful release. Dog menacing walker, one. Raccoon advice, one. Possum advice, one. Report of a mangy fox, one. The animal activity blotter asked me to think about things I've never really considered, like what an eventful skunk release versus an uneventful one would look like and probably smell like. But what I love is that it reminds me how deeply the people around me care. Someone is paying close enough attention to a fox to notice its mange. Someone is concerned enough about the well-being of a possum to pick up the phone for a advice. Last fall, there was a bear in the church parking lot. I was about to get out of the car, distracted by a million things, and there it was, big and shaggy brown and beautiful. I didn't think to call the animal control officer. I, I just watched in amazement as the bear lumbered away. So much hovers at the edge of my attention. I am always trying to fit in one more email. It took a bear at my door to startle me into noticing. In these pandemic days, I'm trying to attend to the world differently. Maybe it's easier because right now there is so much less to look at and listen to. Spring is slow to arrive here, so I'm watching the purple crocus finally push their way through the muddy ground. I've learned the different barks of the neighbor dogs, and I notice how the early magnolia blossoms have come and gone quickly while the bright yellow persithia lasts. There is suffering everywhere in the world right now, including in my own small community, where we are grieving the death of our elderly parents and bringing cups of soup to those who are sick, as are people everywhere. But I dare to hope, I hope that this great silence, which has come along Side the suffering holds the beginning of our healing. 
I hope that the slowness required of us now might teach us to understand ourselves and help us to see the tender, sturdy threads which connect all living things. I've entitled my musing this week, Keeping Your Balance in an Unbalanced World. A quick perusal of the internet tells me I should wait for one of the equinoxes when day and night are equal to muse on balance and absolutely not when the winter solstice is approaching. But where's the fun of that? When reality is in balance and perfect alignment with my life, where is the challenge? My experience says that when I really need to know how to keep my balance is when my world is dark, nameless, unknown, and infinite. It is my spiritual practice to find light in darkness. Name the nameless. Accept the unknown and welcome the infinite. One of the difficulties in musing on balance is it is a state of being we can't achieve through our intellect. If you have ever had vertigo, God forgive, forbid, you know balance has more to do with the inner ear than what is between your ears. As a result, we all experience balance and unbalance differently. Some of us can stand on one foot while touching our nose repeatedly with alternating hands. And others are happy to Walk a straight line without appearing drunk. Others can't do either of these things. Yet our differences don't stop us from thinking everyone is like us, or should be. What indicator we universally assume means our life is out of balance is if we are suffering. While it is counterintuitive, the opposite is often true. Suffering doesn't always mean something's gone wrong. It just means you're living a life. Katie Roboto Griffith, Griffin's meditation on dancing the tango makes my point. She begins with a quote by Miguel Zotto. Tango is a social dance, a dance of the people. What would be the point of having lessons with teachers if we all taught the same? That is the charm of tango. With each person, you find a different character and style. She goes on to write, when I find myself struggling with a person or group, I sometimes consider isolating myself from them altogether. That's when I retreat to a space where I can hear tango music. In an instant, I'm eight years old again. I can smell the hot cafe bustello percolating in the tiny pot of my grandmother's stove while she plays cards with my grandfather and his childhood best friend from Argentina. Music starts to play while my aunts and uncles move the furniture so they can dance. In mere moments, the living room becomes transformed into a space of expression, celebration, and connection. My uncle and my mother are clearly the most skilled dancers. They settle into an easy rhythm together, floating across the old terrazzo floor and the card players occasionally pausing to watch them. Order turns to chaos as everyone takes turns practicing steps on their own. 
And then we engage with other family members. We each bring our own skills, abilities, strengths, and weaknesses to tango. But always we seek to balance feeling our way through the relationship of the dance with each new partner and with respect and love for the person and the music's rhythm. The tango of my youth was not as inclusive as my sweet memory would lead me to believe. Still, I can smile at that memory and know that the spirit of tango extends beyond my eight-year-old understanding to a more inclusive dance, one that makes space for a theology of a better world on a dance floor of mutual respect with people of all genders, sexual orientations, abilities, races, and ethnicities. When I meditate on this inclusive tango of the people, I ask myself, this person or group that I'm struggling with, am I wrestling with a different character or style? Or is something else happening? Do we have an agreement of respect or is one of us trying to dominate what they don't understand? Is one of us more skilled and therefore needs to meet the other partner where they are and help them move to new places? Or does one of us need to engage with other learning partners before we can even attempt to be in a relationship? Living in an unbalanced world can become a problem when it distracts us from living our life in the moment. If we are carrying around the past, we will not notice all that redeems it. If we are anxious about the future, we will find no peace in the present. David Kohlmeyer's meditation on life pushing through, through feels like a confession seeking absolution. It's the kick in the gut we all need once in a while to regain our balance. Did you feel that? No, I didn't. I was distracted. My hand was on my partner's belly trying to feel a move from our soon-to-be-born second child. I'd waited so long with my hand pressing on the same spot that my mind had wandered. I couldn't even remember now what it was I was thinking about. I was angry at myself for not paying attention. I tried to shift my focus and concentrate all my intention, attention on the physical sensation of my hand on their belly. Nothing. Maybe they're asleep, my partner speculated. No, I just needed to wait. And as I waited, my hands started to wander again. The, the latest crazy tweet came to mind. I tried to push it away. Boom. I felt that. I waited to see if it happened again. My mind wandered. All the paperwork and emails piling up in my office. Focus. Kick. Wow, but there's that bill I forgot to pay. How many days past the deadline is? Kit! We both laugh, and I start to cry. It's been so busy during this second pregnancy, I haven't made it to any ultrasound, or even taken the time to put my hand out to feel a kick or a move. I cry in gratitude for feeling this life pushed through my dullness. How many bumps and kicks of precious reality have I missed in my life because I was distracted? I'm not so good at meditating regularly, but if there's anything sitting in silence has taught me, it's that silence doesn't actually exist. Every moment is full to the point of bursting with the reality, whether or not we notice it. It's not that the news and work and the bills don't matter, because they do. And yet, are they more important 
than the pure nectar of this moment of which Rumi speaks, waiting to bump and kick to remind us it is always there. Speaking of bumps and kicks and life pushing through to keep us balanced and er balanced, in earlier times, people in Japan used bamboo and paper for lanterns with candles inside. One night, a blind man visited a friend and was offered a lantern to carry home with him. I do not need a lantern, he said. Darkness or light is all the same to me. I know you do not need a lantern to find your way, his friend replied, but you don't have but if you don't have one, someone else may run into you. So you must take it. The blind man started off with the lantern, and someone ran squarely into him before he had walked very far. Look out where you're going, he exclaimed to the stranger. Can't you see this lantern? Your candle has burned out, brother, replied the stranger. Sometimes life is futile. Sometimes we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. Sometimes good luck is disguised by bad luck and vice versa. Sometimes a kick in the ass propels us forward and sometimes it's just a plain old kick in the ass. The absurdity of the human condition is both very painful and very laughable. It's ironic and incongruous and poignantly imperfect. But that's also half the fun of it. Life comes at us fast. And sometimes the healthiest thing to do is laugh despite the speed. Between the pain of life's lessons and the medicinal laughter of cultivating a good sense of humor, there is the unvanquished absurdity of life kicking us around. Sometimes all we can do is kick back with a ruthless sense of humor, not despite irony and contradiction, but because of Dive in. The water is warm and cold and safe and dangerous. Right, King? But don't let that stop you from living, from dancing the tango through the glaring futility and venomous absurdity of it all with an infectious sense of humor. So to nurture our infectious sense of humor, my closing song really isn't a song yet. Actually, I have two closing pieces. Unless you are living under a rock or are a Republican, You've seen Paddington having tea with the queen. I offer its cuteness as a bookend to the balance and balance to Bocelli's Nessum Dorma. But the thing about cuteness is it has to be balanced by reality if we are to keep our balance. You know, I've become quite fond of some of the songs the Marsh family have written, and they responded very quickly to all this cuteness with the song Don't Come Back.
So, even all that cuteness in the palace hides the fact that there's a lot of darkness in the world. And it's up to you and me to bring us light. My closing words are by William Gardner. We all have two religions. The religion we talk about and the religion we live. It is our task to make the difference between the two as small as possible. And now it's time to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. My question for your breakout groups is an easy one. When life kicks you in the gut, how do you keep your balance? How do you keep your balance? 